Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Planning Committee for the opportunity to present on behalf of the thyroid group our work today. So today we're going to talk about the view of the data uh, from 30,000 feet. But before I do that, I felt obligated to give a little background. So I was thrilled when the TCGA uh, announced that we're going to do thyroid. Thyroid cancer can sort of get shortchanged in the big scheme of, of cancer. I think one of the reasons they, that they did is because thyroid cancer is clearly on the rise. However, the mortality is, uh, of thyroid cancer is not that high. It's actually, over the same period, uh, has actually trended down flat and now is rising up. But clearly, uh, it's one of the few cancer types that is actually increasing uh, in incidence. So I am a professor of pathology, so I have to show some histology. No, just kidding. Um, this is important because the papillary carcinoma, which is what our project's on, uh, has three main types, and it'll come through in the data. So I really wanted to spend just a minute to express this. So papillary carcinoma gets its name from the tumor on the left here, which is a tumor that has finger-like projections or papillae. Um, but not all papillary carcinomas are actually uh, papillary in, the, in terms of their architecture. There's a, a group here that we recognize that are called the follicular variant. Not to be confused with follicular carcinoma, but the follicular variant of papillary carcinoma. And then there's a third main type, the tall cell variant, in which the cells are more, co more columnar uh, than cuboidal. And so we recognize these three variants, and it's kind of important. We know from lots of papers that these have different genetic profiles and different gene expression profiles, and that will also come out in our data set. Uh, these are the genetic, the common genetic defects in, uh, in thyroid cancer. Now, we're just looking at papillary carcinoma. This whole chart shows uh, the whole spectrum of thyroid cancer, but it's worth looking at. Uh, this one on the here is uh, post-Chernobyl, so radiation-induced cancers. So RET rearrangements are common in papillary carcinoma, even more common in radiation-induced areas. Uh, BRAF mutation, very high uh, rate of V600E mutations. Um, some, a small rate of, uh, of BRAF rearrangements, which we'll see. Uh, NTRK rearrangements. Uh, RAS mutations are quite interesting. So notice it goes from 0 to 21 percent. So depending on the cohort of papillary carcinoma, you'll get different numbers. Um, but but we, we definitely know that the follicular variant is enriched for RAS mutations, uh, just as follicular carcinoma. Uh, Pax8 PPAR gamma re rearrangements are thought to be present mostly in follicular carcinoma, but uh, there's been a few recent studies that show that they can also occur in some papillary carcinomas, again, the follicular variant. And then beta catenin and p53 mutations are sort of uh, things that occur down here when tumors show histologic progression to poorly differentiated and undifferentiated carcinoma. So that's the genetic landscape. Um, there's a big issue for, uh, a big opportunity, a big issue for the TCGA. So if you, if you genotype thyroid cancers, differentiated thyroid cancers, you only find one of these driver mutations in about three-fourths of the cases. So we don't know what, that other mutation, what those other mutations are. So this project is all teed up to, to try to find those other mutations. And, and this is um, important, not just for understanding the cancer biology, but there are already cancer diagnostic tests on the market based on genotype. So if we can expand the, the genotypic universe of papillary thyroid cancer, those tests will get better. So again, this is the first look at the data. Uh, we did a data freeze about just a, uh, less than a month ago. Uh, much of what I'll show you today was generated by the Firehose uh, platform. We're really just getting started, and uh, Gaddy wanted me to stress that much of this has not uh, been validated. Uh, here's the, the sample counts. We're, we're pretty far along in the project, and the remaining cases are sort of in the pipeline. So we're thinking we might just wait till we, we full it out to the full 500, uh, but we're still discussing that. Um, here's some of the clinical data. Thyroid cancer occurs in a younger population. The mean age is 46. Um, you know, I was sort of envious when I saw those survival plots. Uh, that's really not so easy in thyroid cancer. It's, it, there's not a lot of deaths. Um, the, to do a good outcome study in thyroid cancer, you sort of need 15 years of follow-up. And so uh, we're not going to have too many Kaplan-Meier plots anytime soon. You can see we've had one death so far. Um, like in all endocrine diseases, uh, way more common in females, almost three to one. And we have a good breakdown of the different histologic types. So here's some of the data. Um, so I w again, I want to stress that papillary carcinoma is a differentiated tumor. Uh, and overall, it has a low mutation rate. So here's the, the mutations per sample. Uh, it's generally uniform across here, but you can see there's a few samples that are jumping up 
and uh, showing that they have a much higher mutation rate. The sequencing coverage is outstanding. And then uh, down here, we can see the rate is quite low. I'm pleased someone showed that plot earlier. I don't know if anyone looked. I looked for thyroid. It was definitely on the, the left end of that plot away from the head and neck squamous cancer. So it's, it's, it's a low mutation rate, not surprising because of it, it is such a well-differentiated tumor. Um, so this is a, a great slide that integrates a lot of the data, and um, I'll spend a little time going through this. This shows uh, the, the common mutations with, with BRAF here, representing 57% of our cohort. Um, we have some RAS genes, and notice the, the BRAF and the RAS genes and the fusions down here uh, are all mutually exclusive, which we've known in, in thyroid cancer, the thinking being that they, you know, having more than one of these doesn't add uh, any biological advantage. Um, the histologic data is up here, and so it's hard to see, so I'll explain it. So the BRAF tumors are enriched for the classical type and the tall cell type which is con consistent with the literature. The RAS mutant tumors are almost all the follicular variants. Uh, and again, this is consistent with what we've known. Um, the tumors with the fusions are mixed between uh, classical type and follicular type, and then these, these so-called wild type tumors where we don't know the, the driver mutation have really a smattering of histologic types. So immediately we're seeing a very strong correlation between genotype, and histologic type. Uh, and, and so that gives me a lot of confidence that this is a quality data set. Um, we could see the fusions, uh, as I mentioned briefly, are here. Uh, RET fusions are the most common, but we're also picking up some Pax 8 PPAR gamma and TRK and a few, and a, and a few uh, BRAF uh, fusions down here. And again, mutually exclusive with BRAF, RAS. I want to bring your attention to uh, this point right here, which is this uh, initiation factor. And it's also mutually exclusive with these other common mutations and the fusion. So that, that's telling me, suggesting to us, that this is uh, you know, a biologically significant mutation, even though we've not validated that. And then the copy number changes are shown here. Uh, notice, there's, across the BRAF cohort, there's not a lot of copy number changes. Uh, across the follicular variant, or the NRAS cohort, there's not a lot. But notice, there's a band right here that represents chromosome 22. So there's an enrichment for loss of chromosome 22 in these RAS mutant tumors. Uh, the tumors with fusions are also pretty quiet. And then the remaining 20%, the so-called wild-type tumors, can be divided into two groups, those with uh, more changes and those that are pretty silent. So the first thing I want to do as a pathologist is I want to go back and look at these tumors over here that don't have a lot of changes and just review their pathology because truth is, endocrine pathologists, we fight over diagnoses a lot, so we need to, we need to uh, look at that. Um, there's also uh, messenger RNA differences uh, that we know, some genes here, and then microRNA, which I'll show a little bit more. So this tells a very compelling story, this one slide, that uh, integrates much of the data and shows that this is a quality data set. Yes, we've replicated some things that we've known, but uh, the integration of all the data in this setting, I don't think anybody has cl come close to doing. So this is that new, uh, potentially novel mutation, this, uh, this X-linked translation initiation factor. Um, it's very interesting. There's no known role in thyroid cancer. And in fact, um, we could find just one other uh, synonymous mutation in the, in the cosmic database. So this is, will take uh, validation, but it's certainly an interesting finding. Uh, fusions, I showed some fusion data. Truth is, we're still going through this. Um, there's much work to be done on fusions. This was some data from an earlier analysis that showed uh, the, the, this fusion right here, which is in the, in the business called RET-PTC1, which is the most common version. And then we have some more novel things, this ETV6 and NTRK3, uh, which, uh, in speaking with Jim Fagan, he's validated this in an independent cohort from the Ukraine. Uh, both in radiation and non-radiation cases, so we think this is a, a real finding. And then Pax-8 PPAR gamma, uh, as we'd expect in a few cases. Uh, on to the methylation work. Uh, the methylation profiling identifies four classes of, of tumors um, that generally correlate, again, with histologic type and mutational status. So we can see there's two groups over here on, on the left that are mostly uh, the classical type and the tall cell type and they are enriched with uh, BRAF mutations. And then on this side, which is uh, more similar to the normals, we have an abundance of the follicular variants 
and tumors with RAS mutation. So the methylation work is integrating nicely into this same uh, compelling story. Uh, a few interesting molecules, uh, MIR-21, which we heard a little bit about this morning, and uh, MIR-146B, both been worked on in, in thyroid cancer, but uh, not at the methylation level, and here we show inverse expression between methylation and expression, so these are interesting leads for us to work on. And then, uh, as a thyroidologist, we always like to look at thyroid-specific genes, not because they tell us that much about the cancer biology, but more they give us uh, thoughts about progression and possibly um, uh, loss of radioactive iodine uh, treatment. And so that's a big issue in our field when tumors become a little less differentiated and no longer respond to radioiodine. So here we can show one gene, uh, thyroid peroxidase, that actually shows a, a differential methylation profile based on uh, the different types, classical, follicular, and tall cell, and work from my group and others, we know that TPO goes down in BRAF mutant tumors uh, compared to the follicular variant, and sure enough, uh, methylation is playing a role here, again, inversely expressed between methylation and expression. So that's a potentially interesting story, and we need to look at other genes in the thyroid like the sodium uh, uh, symporters, sodium iodine symporter, and, and others. Uh, microRNAs, we can use various uh, tools to, to cluster these. Uh, here's a cluster um, driven by MIR-21. So we can get four types or seven types. And notice the four types is actually sh showing some, again, correlation to histologic type, which we know reflects genotype. Um, so I think the microRNAs will fit in nicely. Uh, this needs some work, though. If you look at the British Columbia software versus Firehose, you can generate uh, different clustering uh, algorithms and then actually compare them head to head and, and start to make some sense of how much you believe them. This is kind of interesting. So this is the British Columbia software versus Firehose, four groups versus three. And you can see some cohorts uh, line up nicely here uh, and other cohorts get sort of scattered into others. So we have some work to do to try to figure out what's the, the most uh, meaningful way to look at the microRNA data in a global sense, but clearly there's some useful data uh, in there. And then cancer regulome, uh, Lisa Ipe was kind enough to, to prepare uh, some slides for us in which they look at all the factors, uh, all the measurements throughout the data set, and we just started with something simple, like histologic type and she was able to show that there's many, many, many associations shown here, um, and sure enough, some of the more interesting ones are, uh, are, is MIR-21, which I just showed you, uh, what had me uh, differential methylation expression, and here's, and here's BRAF. So these are all potential leads, and we'll certainly be using uh, some of these software tools uh, which are at our disposal. So, uh, in conclusion, I would argue that we're making good progress. I think we're progressing as planned. I think the cohort is outstanding and truly representative of the disease. I make this point because that's not true for every paper in the literature. People cherry pick cases and what they're publishing is not representative of the broader disease. So I th really do think this cohort is, is accomplishing that. We have a low overall mutation rate um, with few copy number changes, but we have a few tumors that have increased copy number changes, which we'll spend more time working on. And we've uncovered and reproduced strong associations between the tumor morphology, its genotype, its gene expression profile, copy number changes, and methylation status. And we've uncovered many interesting uh, uh, novel uh, leads, mutations, and gene expression patterns to keep us busy for quite some time. So there's much to do. We still have to decide whether we're going to fill out the whole cohort and, and publish or publish where we're at now. Um, but I do think we're on track for our first paper in the middle of next year. Uh, as, as with all the projects, there's many, many people to uh, thank, and I would, would hate to go through these individually because I'm sure I've left people, some people out, but clearly I'd like to thank uh, Gaddy Getz, who I've not met yet. So Gaddy, if you're here, come up and introduce yourself. Um, but thank you very much. Oh, there you are. Tom, thank you very much. You think that the uh, fact that so many of them have BRAF mutations would suggest that uh, the BRAF inhibitors might be a therapeutic approach for them? Well, you know, I, I wish, uh, you know, maybe Jim Fagan can answer that. He's more in tune to uh, the clinical trials. There's certainly many clinical trials ongoing. Steve Sherman at MD Anderson is working on that. But I've not heard, it's not distilled down into like this home run where people are ready to give up radioactive iodine. I know. Uh, Matt. Sure. So uh, just I, I 
couple questions and then a comment. My first question is um, about the relationship between uh, you know, thyroid carcinoma and lung adenocarcinoma, because I think there are a number of similarities. First, the, the major, you know, as you very well know, the major uh, marker and one of the leading amplified genes in, in lung adenocarcinoma is the thyroid transcription factor one gene. Uh, you know, suggesting potentially some 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 common etiology, and uh, you know, there's I, also I, ret rearrangements too that are common. there's ret rearrangements, yeah. BRAF and RAS mutations, yeah. and I'm wondering if you've started to look at commonalities between the diseases or have thoughts about how you to know, do so. Certainly, that that would be a good comparison, but there's some jump things that jump out, like there, there's very few EGFR mutations in in thyroid, um, so I think the similarity is there, but I don't know how strongly it'll hold up. And I think my second thing is more of a comment, which is I think if uh, the rest of the uh, cancer community could do as well as the uh, thyroid cancer uh, community has done, uh, we probably wouldn't need TCGA or a National Cancer Institute. So we were very struck by the, uh, the survival data. Yes, yes. Well, um, no, that, that's not to um, belittle thyroid cancer. Most of the deaths, though, are actually in those poorly differentiated and anaplastics. If I showed those survival plots, the Kaplan, you know, the survival plot for anaplastic is, is measured in, in six months. So thyroid cancer represents the whole spectrum, and I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to get to a more aggressive thyroid cancer project, which will then nicely integrate right into this, because we have many cases that have both papillary carcinoma sitting right next to anaplastic carcinoma. It would be nice to profile both of those uh, in parallel. Thank you, Matt. All right. uh, I don't know Steve? if there's... Could I ask one last question? Yeah. Thyroid cancer, you know, is one of the most interesting ones with respect to heritability and familial uh, syndromes and, you know, sibling risk. And, you know, it's been in the past discussed that the outcome may be related to whether they're the early onset family uh, driven cases versus the more sporadic later ones. When you look at the data set you've put together, are you able to in any way parse out uh, or do you have information on? on the heritability in terms of family-related cases or, or the like? Or? So we have to separate, uh, obviously, medullary thyroid carcinoma, right. which has a much stronger familial association than, you know, sort of follicular cell thyroid cancers. I know the group at Ohio State has worked on this. There's some uh, germline mutations of, uh, I believe, TTF1 that, that right. so, you know, uh, make you susceptible to papillary. So there are familial cases of, of familial papillary carcinoma but it's not nearly as strong as medullary. That's something that I think we'll get around to looking at, but it's not something that's going to jump out at us right away. Thank you. Okay.